Buenos días a todos otra vez. Gracias por estar aquí. Good morning, everyone, once more. Thanks for being here. We're about to start our last session, moderated by Jose Seguro Rabel, director of Casa Africa. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good day, everyone, and welcome to uh, the fourth panel of this much-needed seminar for academic cooperation between Africa and Spain. Certainly, higher education in Africa is a key factor for the development of the African continent. And this panel, entitled uh, Professional Flight Links with the Entrepreneurial World and Role of Private Companies and Public-Private Partnerships, Business Schools, Vocational Training, Program Young Generation as Change Agents. Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? It is a long title, which suggests that at least before each participation, we will uh, need to uh, pose some comments on the role universities play and the role universities play today in a society of knowledge and how that is linked to uh, the training of students and the the uh, uh, best possible performance of society and productive systems. Therefore, I will add my own reflection by uh, addressing uh, the matter straight at the core. I would like to link this uh, uh, panel with the previous ones the contents of this session in connection with the uh, presentations delivered yesterday and the uh, three panels where we witnessed much rigor and uh, intellectual correctness. So, Connection, education, society, industry, this uh, sort of chain. I was thinking that it, uh, it is obvious to all of us that education in the 21st century has advanced into different technologies and mechanisms and a different way of being conceived than or, or from the conception we had about it uh, three, four, or five decades ago. The present society of knowledge in which we live is not only based in the mere reproduction of knowledge in universities. It is all about generating knowledge now. It is about constantly grasping the knowledge that has been produced and placing it in an international context in which rapid changes in the forms of uh, production and in relationships take place. The Einsteinian concepts of space and time have changed. Obviously, knowledge has always played a fundamental role in the development of society. That's more than obvious. However, the way we value knowledge today in economic systems has changed as well. Economic and social development shows or highlights the fact that one of the main differences between today and the past comes from the organized generation of knowledge. 
the generation of knowledge, I repeat, and also the way it is disseminated, appropriated, used, and valued. These are undoubtedly the factors that add to the growing importance of knowledge in the workings and performance of today's uh, production systems around the world known as uh, knowledge-based economy. So much has been said in previous panels about knowledge and how Spanish and African universities uh, connect to it. Much has been said about science, the environment, the digitalization of knowledge. And on today's panel, we have one opportunity to connect the thoughts expressed yesterday to how knowledge is used to develop economy in different areas. It is uh, therefore an honor for me as moderator of this fourth panel to introduce our uh, panel members today. So I will introduce them one by one. I will give them the floor. We are all going to stick to the allocated time. So without further ado, I will start with, well, I was going to go left to right. But I don't want to make this political, so I will start over the corner with Beatrice Bayet. She has a, a degree in translation and interpretation and political sciences by uh, the Pony University. Since 2018, she has been the head of the strategy and innovation department for the Mundos Association and coordinator of the Supporting uh, Alliance for African Mobility Project, geared at promoting the development of uh, the professional training center in Africa. So, Beatrice, you have the word first. Hello. Okay. I believe everyone can hear me. So, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers of this very interesting and necessary seminar for considering our SAM project, Supporting Africa Mobility, as an example for a public-private partnership. Beyond uh, its name, the SAM project, this uh, is also a word in ancient uh, Africans. The, it spells S-A-A-M, and it means together, which clearly illustrates uh, the work we're doing today. As a pilot project, SAM sets the path for the future in terms of intercontinental mobility and education for uh, professional learning. And we're deeply proud to have led this project headquartered in Spain. The group is made up by two Spanish organizations. One is the Sambiator uh, Training Center in the northern regions, and uh, uh, the other one is the Mundus organization, headquartered in both Zaragoza and Barcelona. I am here as an author of the project and as a, a representative of its coordination and dissemination. In early 2019, the European Commission launched a singular tender for pilot projects to favor mobility in vocational training to cover uh, the future, what was to be the future Erasmus Plus program. The program is financed under the umbrella of a project joining the EC with the African community within the framework of the African Union and European Communion for Skills for Youth Employment Program. This program uh, 
financed two projects around the world to pilot uh, the oncoming Erasmus Plus program in uh, the African continent. One of these projects is called Uberstep, promoted by Italy with a budget of 2 million euros. And the project I bring to you today is uh, the second one, SAM, promoted by Spain with a budget of 4 million euros. This project is not framed, as uh, several other pilot projects are, by the uh, present Erasmus Plus control unit, because our aim is uh, to set a new path rather than walking an old one. The program is controlled by three general directorates of the EC, joining international cooperation, education and sports, and employment. Our intention with SAM is laying bridges between two continents to enhance training in the field of vocational training, starting with level 3 uh, all the way up to, the, to level 8 of the European Reference Framework. And we focused on three specialties because uh, that was a part of the tender, it's, it was not our choice. So we're addressing centers specializing in engineering, agriculture, and tourism. Well, tourism and hospitality. So we put together 36 beneficiary partners and over 15 associated partners. The beneficiaries are located both in Europe and in Africa. In Europe, we have 17 beneficiary partners from eight different countries. Spain, France, Portugal, Italy, Belgium, Germany, Finland, and Greece. And in Africa, although the floor was set for 10 African countries, we decided to go for uh, the maximum possible number. So we have gathered 19 partners from 16 African countries. I will name them in alphabetical order, Angola, Benin, Cape Verde, Cameroon, Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, or Ivory Coast, Kenya, Liberia, Malawi, Mali, Nigeria, Senegal, Sudan, and, Tun and Tunisia. And you're probably wonder how we're going to manage working with such diversity of countries for 40 months. Well, for us, the key lies on establishing peer-to-peer -peer connections. Everyone here is uh, from the academic field, so you know what I mean by peer-to-peer. -peer. We established connections so that people uh, will speak the same language, academic language, I mean, certainly not uh, the same native language, but uh, they connect academically by sharing the same specialty. So our project is, has done this to be sustainable in the future beyond the funding period. We're a multi-stakeholder cooperation. We uh, cover a, a vast space of the public-private partnership. Most of the teaching centers in Africa are part of the Don Bosco network and Salesian network in Africa, which have a, a majority representation in SAM. More, more than 80% of the schools we partnered with in Africa are part of this institute network. And they're coordinated by Don Bosco Tech Africa, headquartered in Nairobi, which has influence on more than 34 African countries with over 102 training centers. We also have vocational training school associations, nonprofit associations, institutions directly related to the EC. European umbrella associations for non-formal education and experts in multiculturality directly reporting to the EC. So 
The SAM project has a global approach and wants to uh, use these peer-to-peer -peer connections so that sustainability is the final outcome of our project, which will undoubtedly fa will favor multilateral mobility in the future Erasmus Plus program. You know that the mobility we discussed yesterday uh, for connecting universities has been working and working optimally for years. But for medium grade or, or uh, a ground grade, mobility with the European continent uh, has, is not performing as well. And uh, I can guarantee that most uh, government and most education ministries are addressing this kind of strategy as a, as a path to achieve the employability of thousands of youths in the labor in the labor market. Well, since we're speaking here in Spain, you may wonder. Uh, where and what we do in Spain, well, we have the Basque region and the whole ICASLAN network. It's a public center network for vocational training in the Basque country. Over five centers will benefit from our initiative. We also have centers in Aragon and Catalonia and in Madrid with the Tech Don Bosco organization. Also in, in, the, well, in the region of Huelva, in Andalusia, in the south of Spain, thanks to the Jose Graíño Center. And each of those centers connects to three or four African centers. Just to give you an idea of the network, here in Madrid, we will have people from Benin, Kenya, Sudan, and Liberia. And these centers will work from uh, the start until the end of the SAM project in peer-to-peer -peer groups. For 40 months, we requested an extension because obviously uh, the COVID-19 pandemic held us down. So we will continue to work until 2024. The SAM project involves three mobility flows because I believe it is important to clarify the way we're going to work. So the first stage of SAM analyzes the present status of education in Africa. Well, I was a little bit naive when I wrote that stage one because I assumed there was a framework holding the African continent together in terms of education policies, but there is no such thing. As a matter of fact, I am going back to Cameroon, and I was talking to Kai yesterday, and it turns out that there are several systems, not just one. So imagine the, the mess you can come up with in 16 different countries. You can never get a real analysis of the situation. Actually, UNESCO contacted us to ask what we're doing and whether we have any results that uh, they had no access to, because obviously they came up with the same difficulties as we did. So to conduct this analysis, we're mobilizing over a hundred teachers from Europe to their peer centers in Africa. For over two weeks, they will be doing job shadowing and real-time analysis of uh, learning centers study, first at a regional level and then in each individual center. That's the first stage. The second stage is about bringing staff from Africa to Europe. It's a one-month stay. They will attend their peer centers for three weeks. And the fourth week, they're all going to Brussels to get a training course on the internationalization of their own centers to better understand how we work in this wonderful uh, program, Erasmus Plus, in Europe. And the third st stage involves students coming to Europe. The possibility of sending European students to Africa was not open, so we only have incoming mobility. 
More than 300 students from 16 African countries will be landing in Europe, in these eight countries, for a one-month stay or for, for two-month stays in dual education mode with the internships in companies in the destination countries. In some, we're mobilizing 600 people between two continents in 40 months. So, what's uh, Sam's status right now? Well, I'm thinking COVID. So, in late 2019, we held a wonderful meeting in Brussels, and in February 2020, we could only meet with our European partners to explain the project, and then, bang! All uh, the alarms were triggered for a world pandemic. So we came to a halting scratch, to a scratching halt, and started wondering how uh, to work uh, uh, together virtually online. And we created uh, a mode of virtual mobility. And the silver lining is that we have now made our partnership extremely sustainable thanks to all these online meetings that have helped our partners understand one another. So in Kenya, Cameroon, Cape Verde, Malawi, and Senegal, we're restarting mobility in September this year. You have no idea the challenges we have faced to facilitate uh, this kind of mobility in COVID times. It has been an incredible journey, and uh, we have learned a lot along the way. But the most important challenges of SAM in involve a never-ending list, and we still don't know what's uh, lurking around the corner. But obviously, our most important challenges are linguistic communication. Better now? Apparently. So, language communication. And imagine a, a Sudanese student landing in Finland. Well, that's a task ahead of us. So we have to talk about the language aspect of mobility, which is a huge challenge, not an unsurmountable one, though. And uh, we're also getting resources from, Euro to, from Europe to get or to face these challenges. Connections between and among universities. Well, I cannot imagine a connection between two training centers, each in one country, one in Africa and one in Europe, without previous preparation for uh, traveling and welcoming and multiculturality preparedness. Because we need to understand the impact this mobility will have on, the, on these individuals personally and professionally. So how do we pick the right people, teachers and students for the program? And then the democracy of mobility. Yesterday, Diego was asking what we can do to help ministries, uh, foreign, affair, uh, foreign affair offices, embassies. Well, you can do everything. Whenever I have to deal with traveling, I have to visit all the embassies, consulates, and education ministries involved to uh, make some knowledge to them, because if they don't know the project, they will probably make it more complicated to issue a visa for a group of 18 to 23-year-olds leaving their country for the first time in a group of 10. I'm, I'm nearly done. And we also need to understand uh, the, the local impact on the labor market. Obviously, we contact companies to help them understand the impact of their future labor to have had international experience, because most of them have no idea. Over here, when it comes to uh, picking staff, uh, uh, an Erasmus alumni is an asset for any company. 
But uh, this, uh, the same situation does not occur in Africa, and uh, entrepreneurs don't know what assets they could have in their hands. So uh, the uh, last part of the program is guaranteeing the return of these students to their original communities. It certainly is a challenge, and we have much thinking to do about it. But we still have 36 months ahead of us to deal with that. And uh, our ears are open for advice and uh, for sharing your academic experience and your connections amongst universities. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Next, we will hear Jose Carlos Tiscuende Gallego presently chairing the internationalization unit of CEPIE and, well, just to remind you, CEPIE, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Casa Africa have come together in this powerful task force that has led to uh, us holding this uh, uh, seminar today. On the side of SAPI, we've heard their director, who honors us with his presence today, along with other officials, and Jose Carlos. Well, he has a degree in geography and history by the Complutense University of Madrid, and at present he leads the internationalization office of SAPI. Also, consulting spokesperson for this internationalization unit in the Spanish service for the internationalization of education. This body reports directly to the Ministry of Universities and hence directly to the Secretary of Universities. And uh, the secretary in his participation yesterday actually referred to Jose Luis's office. Beyond that, our next speaker has a vast experience in several ministries in Spain that include internal affairs, defense, in uh, different uh, uh, periods. So, from all his background and present knowledge, we have a very interesting presentation to expect bringing new data to uh, the ones we've heard so far. You have the floor. Thank you. I would like to congratulate the organizers of this seminar and uh, greet you all here in the room and all those that are following us by streaming. I'm going to speak about a project that was introduced yesterday. The Young Generation as Change Agents project is a very ambitious project, but we started from scratch. It's a pilot project, 26 months long. We, on the 30th of June, we will finish and uh, please let me introduce some information. Both the director of universities and director of the CPA have already introduced this project. But in this panel discussion, we should refer to one of the stages of the project. And uh, this project that has been funded by the European Union, DG Home, within the partnership of mobility and the CP is the coordinator and uh, there are many other agents not only here in Spain but also international ones as the International Migration Organization and also in Morocco. This project is a circular mobility project. The project generates synergies between Spain and Morocco students that come to be trained at our universities have the obligation to return to their country of origin, Morocco, to be part of the business fabric as is required by the government of Morocco. There are three stages in this project, a pre-departure stage, uh, Moroccan authorities 
identify some essential areas of knowledge for the development of the country, and they choose their students. A second stage, the mobility stage, where 100 students come to be educated at Spanish universities, and the third stage is the return and integration to their country of origin. And I want to focus on this third stage because it's related to the objective of this panel discussion. And secondly, it will be a reminder to all of you. We go far beyond knowledge here. We are tackling cross-sectorial migration uh, matters. In the third stage, Moroccan authorities identify some essential areas of knowledge for the country. Energy, engineering, renewable energies, economic intelligence, cyber security, urban and environmental planning, logistics, transport, urban policies, social economy and solidarity, the law, oh, the right to have a business, and tourism management. Once those students have been selected by the Moroccan authorities, they study a master's course in our universities. And those students, just to give you some other relevant data, 62% of them were women and the rest were men, just mentioning gender policies. Those students have been here for an academic year conducting a master's course. And I would like to connect those areas of knowledge that I've just mentioned with the masters that they have been studying here in Spain. Because those students, when they finish their master's study, they should do an end of master uh, study and also an entrepreneurial project in their countries. There are masters so bombastic in their names. For example, the modeling of coolers propelled by solar energy, automatic um, control of watering based on mobile sensors, land sliding, the use of multilateral logistic models in the Scala Basin in Morocco, uh, advising services to create uh, tourist uh, companies, uh, creation of uh, business using mobile applications, and many different number of projects. So we are linking an area of knowledge required by the Moroccan authorities with the students being trained and educated in Spain, but then implementing those projects in Morocco. What does the European Union do? In addition to giving us 2.6 million euros, 96% is paid by the European Union and the rest by the SAPA. So we don't only provide the training, but also we are responsible for those projects and we give a lot them capital. We give awards from with amounts from 10,000 euros to 500 euros. And the rest, we understand, that because we cannot uh, pay all those entrepreneurial projects in Morocco, but we provide an ongoing support to all of them to generate self-employment among the students or also for the active search of jobs in Morocco. And why do I say that this is important? There is a group of sectors and institutions that are participating. I've just mentioned the G Home from the European Union, but also the International Migration Organization. In Spain, also the Ministry of Universities as coordinator of CEPIE, and also the Minister of Inclusion, Social Security, and Migration. We also had the participation of the Cervantes Institute to give an added value so that uh, those students can learn Spanish in Spain. And also for the mapping and follow-up of the ranking of the best projects, we had the collaboration of the Foreign Trade Institute. We also have the support of the Moroccan authorities, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Education and Vocational Training. And we also had the participation of the Employment Office in Morocco that have been following those students very closely uh, on their return. 
in the third stage, during the third stage that started in January this year and ends on the 30th of June, we had the support of private businesses, not only Spanish ones located in Morocco, but also Moroccan private firms. In addition to the language and entrepreneurship courses and also the masters in Spain, the ANAPEC has trained those students with a very close follow-up from the Ministry of Social Security and Migration and the ISEX to do a skill matching between the Spanish companies located in Morocco and the profile of those students to see if they could find a job and benefit from their knowledge. Uh, something that is also very important is the participation of a startup, a startup Morocco, that has been monitoring and following up the entrepreneurial projects from those uh, students, always enhancing them access to funding in addition to the one that we offer them. With this capitalization uh, between 10,000 and 500 euros that I've mentioned, they have also channeled them towards different subsidies and they have closely followed up the projects. And now, what about the results? The results, I don't want to overwhelm you with data, but they are very promising. 55% are already business in Morocco, and the remaining 45 will do it in the next three to six months. In a time horizon of 12 months, 65% of those projects already contract or hire between one and five people. It's not only self-employment, but they are also generating employment, whatever they set their company. So 65% will employ between one and five, and the rest more than 10 people, up to 45% with a profit above 10,000 dirham. We're talking about objective data. We're not talking about delusions here, but of real data. I would also like to highlight some important matters here. This type of pilot projects go far beyond the project itself. It's not only setting some synergies between Spain and Morocco and their international relations, but they generate wealth here and there to our universities because those students uh, study masters, they generate wealth in the Spanish society. They have to stay here and live here for a whole academic year, but they also generate wealth wherever they come back throughout the country, throughout Morocco, and they generate wealth for themselves and for their surroundings. But it goes far beyond, because we have the role of the public and private institutions. It generates a business fabric and also synergies between private and public companies. And But what is more important is that this type of projects that have been a model. The European Union is always knocking at our door, uh, asking us to replicate this project in other parts of the world. So in addition to be in line to those ideas related to sustainable development, and this is the way I want to conclude my presentation, this type of project does not only generate wealth, and I've been working for many years in the Ministry of Domestic Affairs, more than 18 years in the area of international and of European funds. Throughout my professional life, I've been collecting funds or trying to find funding for the, for the police forces to control migration in Spain, generating different skills, infrastructures, control means, security means, whether at Ceuta or Melilla Wall or purchasing equipment, helicopters, etc., to control migration. And in those training, we've been able to train the police forces in Mauritania.
Tania, Morocco. But I was missing something. And the need of the African population to migrate. Why do they have to migrate to Europe? Not only due to our lifestyle, but also to generate some expectations about life. And these type of projects go far beyond what I was used to do in the Ministry of Domestic Affairs. We were only setting controls to migration. And with those projects, we are not only not controlling, but we are offering opportunities and jobs wherever they are needed at the African continent. If you give a job, if you generate a business fabric, whatever is needed, those students will not have the need to migrate to Europe. And this is one of the objectives of the DG Home with this type of projects. And that's why I want to stress that we need to replicate, we need to promote those countries to request to El CPE or to our institutions and or to the European Union so that this type of project is just a pilot project that will be replicated in the future. As the General Secretary of Universities said yesterday, this project is very prestigiously seen by Mauritania, Senegal, our closest countries or neighbor countries. And I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to present my project so that you all know about these projects that go far beyond what we expect from Africa and Europe. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jose Carlos. And I'm also very happy to have a chance to listen to what you said at the end of your presentation about migration. My experience, in my experience, I totally have to agree with what you said. Now we're going to give the floor to Eduardo Mesegue, Director of Legal and Institutional Affairs of Hebe Foods. Eduardo started his professional career as a representative of Hebe Fuchs. This company is present in Spain, Italy, the Netherlands, Russia, in 28 African countries and the Middle East with food products, different uh, food products under the brand Gallina Blanca, Star, Jumbo, or Gran Italia. Since the year 2016, he's the director of institutional and legal affairs of this company. He has a long experience in the search of solving management problems. And as he told me in a conversation before this panel discussion, uh, he has a lot to say. So without further ado, we give him the floor. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I would also like to thank the organizers of this seminar for having invited me to be here. I feel a bit overwhelmed. Uh, and as the chairperson said, I've been working for long in Jake Foods for those that are in Spain is well the company is known as Gallina Blanca it's a company created in Spain more than 80 years ago at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War in fact the creation of this company made us have in our DNA to be able to manage difficult situations or conflictive situations or to be able to work in difficult times. This has been present in the GB Foods history, in the history of my company and is part of our daily life. GB Foods is present in 50 countries, basically in Europe and Africa, and we have a turnover of around one point. 1,500 million euros. Our basic products are broth, tomato, mayonnaise, and as the 
best known products in Africa. Our presence in Africa started during the 1970s, so we have been present in the continent for 50 years, and we know what's going on in Africa and what is still pending. And now in the continent, GB Foods has more than 3,000 employees distributed in 24 countries. And now I would like to highlight that of those 3,000 employees, only 10 are European. The rest are nationals from different uh, national citizens from different European, uh, African, sorry, countries. We started to sell to Africa in the 1970s at a time of world crisis where many companies had production surplus that had to locate whatever and uh, no matter how we could see very soon that our product uh, manufactured in Spain was not appropriate for Africa because the, of the taste uh, and the liking was different and from the beginning we could see that our product didn't fit with the final consumers in Africa. And that's how those that know about our company, that's how we created the real know-how of our company to get to know what our consumers want from us instead of just manufacturing one product and place it whatever. And uh, this is what we have been doing in the past 50 something years in Africa. We've been evolving, looking for local recipes, and we have adapted our products, uh, whatever it was needed. And that's how we have been advised by foundations uh, concerned with nutrition. We have incorporated to our products vitamin A in order to obtain a better nutrition value in our products. And today, we can say that we have a multiplicity of products and different um, product range adapted to each country and to each country's taste. So we can conclude that uh, GB Foods philosophy compared to other companies, and this is an experience accumulated in the last half a century in Africa, is that we don't have to export our product. We don't want to make one product and export it, but we want to sell the product that consumers need for their daily use. So that uh, is also nutritional. In order to be here in the last 50 years, we have developed different implementation models. As you can imagine we just had a commercial network that went country after country to locate this product. Then we had a more logistic distribution system. Then we started to issue licenses, building plants uh, locally and managing the plants under our supervision. But several years ago, we discovered that we needed to be deployed in Africa. That's how we could create, as the previous speaker said, we could create wealth for the country we were in. And creating wealth in the country, we attained many different objectives. First, profits for the company. I'm not going to hide that this is a private company. And the first objective of a private company is to meet their objectives and make some profits. Uh, and in this line, the countries we were in also developed their own industry. We created jobs, and those jobs were rooted in the different countries so that the population didn't ha have the temptation to migrate to Europe, because we all know that this dream is not as golden as they might think from Africa. 
We believe, and this is something also important and related to yesterday's and today's presentation, we believe that the business is much better managed when it's managed at a local level, locally, and that's the reason why in Africa we have so such a reduced number of Europeans. Why is better if it's managed by Africans? They know their country. They get to know the administration. They know the product. They know the distribution network, and that gives a benefit to all both countries. And to be able to work with this type of knowledge about a, con about a country allows us to increase our business value. But it's not only this, when we need to contact the government, when consumers themselves buy a product that has been manufactured in the country and that has the national stamp and recipe, that generates a sense of pride, a sense of identification with the product so that the product is better accepted, that just a, a product manufactured by a multinational that has the same recipe for all countries. How do we manage all of this? As I said, more than 3,000 employees uh, with a high level training. The training has been provided in different uh, solutions. We should say that as a company, we have really found a lot of talent in Africa. We have found well-trained and uh, people in Africa. And with this uh, standard training, we have just uh, provided some additional training uh, courses, either mm, taking them into Spain or moving from Spain some uh, experts in order to implement some ad hoc or technical uh, training courses. So the GB Foods staff is um, staff that is very well trained. We have a high uh, turnover. Many of the employees trained in GB Foods are then called or tempted, sort of say, by other companies. Uh, even though it's true, it generates the problem of too much turnover of our staff. But we feel a high level of satisfaction because we know we have contributed to the knowledge and this way of uh, managing companies so that they end up being called by our competitors. As I said, the whole group is uh, covering the national and the local level. The, the, the farmers in Nigeria or the staff from HR or administration, and in this regard, I should say, as the rest of the panelists have already said, that gender issues, the presence of uh, women is uh, really taken into account in the group's management, GB Foods, after different political uh, policies to promote uh, women's presence in our company. but. We can say that today 40% of middle management and senior management in Africa are women in my company, 40%. And those positions are of women that are really well trained and didn't have their position due to their gender, but due to their knowledge. And uh, we haven't limited ourselves to those uh, gender policies in Africa, or oh, Africa is a country that, or oh, is a continent that has certain needs, and there are still many people that haven't had access to education. And the 
African could be considered as a patriarchal society where um, so starting from the fact that this product is bought or purchased by women in our markets, we wanted to support women in need generating uh, jobs so that uh, they could have access into uh, employment. After all those years, we have a certain experience about Africa and what we have done is to learn every day and try to oh, try to help those around us even though we are a private company. This has also been our way to grow, creating wealth for all. This has been the case in my opinion and we will continue to do so. We still have objectives to grow and to improve our position in Africa. And as a conclusion, and as the chairperson said at the beginning of the session, yesterday we saw many interesting information about the training, uh, the implementation, or the need to Im improve uh, the presence of Spanish language in Africa. And when we get when we attain these objectives to train people in Europe and then this talent to go back to the country of origin. The last part of the chain is job creation, in my opinion. And I believe that private companies have a role to play in this regard. And it would be great to have uh, measures that promote the presence of private businesses for the benefit of all that will be beneficial for Spain as a country and also to African countries providing technology, jobs, knowledge, and all of that will allow us to develop the African continent. Yesterday, one of the speakers said that Africa in 2050 might have multiplied its population by two or maybe even more. And this is something that should help uh, the businesses. Just for the fact of uh, being in Africa, if they can uh, share their knowledge, if they can share their technology, if they can really share their way they manage the companies, they will be successful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I felt also very happy to hear that there's job creation and a promotion of food culture, food safety, and all the health um, implications benefiting from the historic uh, culture of uh, the Africans in each of the countries. I'm now going to give the floor to Nasara Cabrera Albo. Nasara, she's my friend, by the way, she's from the Canary Islands. Uh, She's a doctor in sociology by La Laguna University, master in feminist studies in public policies and gender violence, expert in cooperation project management, cooperation to development project management. She is general director at the government of uh, the regional government of the Canary Islands in the area of relations to Africa. She has a long academic uh, career. She's also a researcher, and she's been international cooperant, intercultural mediator. She's part of the scientific committee of the Migration Monitoring Center. She combines the general direction, her role in the general direction of the Canary government with teaching at uh, Las Palmas University for seven years. She's been teaching in the Department of Sociology and Social Work. She has many, a multiplicity of publications that I will not refer to now. Also transnational activities with Moroccan migrants living in the Canary Islands. 
activist advocate in the Palestine's women's movement in brief, in summary. With everything that shows her social commitment, and for me it's a great honor to introduce her to all of you and give her now the floor. And because we're friends, I didn't uh, dare to say so to the previous speakers, but uh, please limit yourselves to the time because it's limited. Well, thank you very much, Director. I think it's easy to tell that we're friends based on your kind presentation. So I'll, I'm going to set a stopwatch for my participation. I would like to thank the organizing entities and wish everyone here a good day. And thank the authorities and anyone uh, watching us over streaming. I'm here to tell you about the programs uh, we have launched in academic cooperation in the Canaries government and also the role played by universities not only in these programs for academic cooperation but also in initiatives that they have launched themselves. I will also make a few mentions on the impact of some of our programs in the career of the young beneficiaries thereof and I will also refer to the role of companies the role of companies in, the, in these programs with a few closing remarks. I will start by mentioning the importance of academic cooperation and the Canarian-African uh, relations, which is also an important part of the interna internationalization strategy of the Canarian economy by promoting our quality education in African countries. I will start talking about a program that started in 2017. It's a scholarship program for youths from some African countries to come to the Canary Islands for uh, master's degrees in La Laguna and Las Palmas universities in the islands. There have been three editions of this program, which is launched the fourth one, and the tender will be open or closes tomorrow for a master's degree in the year 21 to 22. Adding all the positions uh, offered in this fourth edition, we will have granted 71 scholarships to youths from Senegal, uh, Mauritania, and uh, uh, Cape City and uh, Cape Town because they're closest to us in the archipelago and because they're the ones uh, we have most institutional connections with. But this edition has been extended to Gambia, Equatorial Guinea, Ghana, and Ivory Coast. In this fourth edition, we're offering 17 uh, scholarships in four officially acknowledged master's degrees mostly addressed to Spanish-speaking youths of the nationalities I just mentioned. These scholarships cover all expenses of uh, travel, visas, travel insurance, uh, housing, and tuition for a full school year, which usually uh, start or goes from September to July, even August in some cases. For the 20 to 21 year, we couldn't launch the uh, scholarships for Africa due to mobility restrictions on account of the pandemic. But along with the Women for Africa Foundation, we founded a program called Learn Africa Foundation with scholarships addressed to women in the entire continent to uh, go in online studies. Although these uh, scholarships are addressed to Spanish speakers in Africa, we've also introduced lessons in other languages like English and French. In this case, besides the two universities from the Canary Islands that have created ad hoc courses for this program, we've also had other contributions from the uh, Health School of the Canary Islands and the Canary Islands Technological Institute. So adding the courses we will offer in the, the uh, third center of this Africa Canaries, uh, in the future, the total will be 76 courses. These are not only official master's degrees, but also 
certifications, specialization courses, and even language courses. So far, 200 scholarships have been granted to African women of different nationalities, and we expect to offer another 100 in the next edition. It's important to highlight that one of the main objectives leading to the creation of the Canary Africa Scholarship Program is not only contributing to the qualification of beneficiaries and, their, and further their education to generate the wealth other speakers have mentioned in these countries and in our islands, but also considering that in the future these beneficiaries could actually be part of uh, our staff or, or part of the staff of Spanish or Canarian uh, companies in their own countries of origin. We also consider ongoing training of professionals in a trainer of trainers uh, program. This program started in 2020. It was a uh, a live program in medical technology with experts from Har Harvard and the Queen's University meeting with Canarian experts in the islands with professionals from engineering and medicine coming over to the Canaries to uh, learn or take a course for several weeks. Thanks uh, to the, our new online possibilities, we have expanded these courses to other areas in urban wastewater treatment and epidemiology in cooperation with the World Health Organization and IZIT in Mauritania. In this second edition, which is still running, we're offering not only these courses, but also a mixed theoretical practical training for uh, nurses in Mauritania for attention and ER, to ER patients and also a training for pharmaceutical uh, representatives or pharmacists in Mauritania in cooperation with the program that was already running on the ground uh, fostered by EZIT. So in total, we will be training nearly 400 professionals in engineering and health coming from eight African countries. Along these lines, we also had another course along with Women for Africa for nurses in Ghana in two different hospitals. Well, the course was taught in the nursing schools from Santa Cruz de Tenerife and La Laguna University to train 50 Ghana nurses. As I said at the beginning, these courses have played a key role. For instance, in the case of the La Laguna University, an inter-university master's degree has uh, been created for energy decarbonization for emerging countries along with the Cape Town University. And this will be the first inter-university master's degree with an African university in the Canary Islands and other interesting uh, initiatives like Campus Africa of the La Laguna University, which will be celebrating its fourth edition in November on climate changes, uh, climate challenges in a global context. Also, for the first time, an area of African relations has been created in the Las Palmas de Gran Canaria University to uh, reveal the small role played by African studies in Spain and try to help uh, further African participation in the words of uh, Professor Amici Ragundu. We've tried to do follow-up of beneficiaries to assess the impact of this training on their careers and whether the objectives established have been reached. Obviously, not a long time has gone by since we started. We're only talking about three editions of the program. And we have a few results, but not all respondents or not everyone has responded to the survey. But just to mention some results, we can say that 30% of our beneficiaries are already employed. And out of that 30%, 80% are actually working in, uh, within their level of qualification. 20% of uh, those are considering furthering their studies. In some cases, they consider doing it in the Canary Islands, and 20% are still outside their country of origin in countries like Portugal, Spain, or Belgium. 
and a small percentage of them are in the Canary Islands. So we cannot do a very thorough evaluation, at least not yet. As for the role of companies, we still haven't uh, uh, seen that these people integrate to Canarian uh, companies in their countries of origin. And in terms of the impact of companies in the education of the surrounding communities, we lack the data. And precisely for this reason, we're presently conducting a study via the Real Instituto El Cano to assess the role of Canarian industries in African graduates. And by way of conclusion, just some final thoughts. Even if we have this huge variety of training courses. Okay, that's my timer going off. So, there is still a lot of work to do. We still don't have vocational training programs, which is perhaps one of the reasons why students are not integrating into uh, companies since perhaps Uh, these companies require higher uh, technical skills, so we would have to do that skill matching we just uh, heard about from Sabia to uh, generate this objective. We also need to generate a full network to make the best possible use of all the know-how generated in these academic programs and systematize follow-up pro uh, procedures to truly assess and measure the impact these programs ultimately have on students. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nasara. That was wonderful. Next, we have uh, Zab Sabine Mazbek currently Chair of International Development for the Middle East and Africa region in the Instituto Empresa Training Facility. Also a young woman born in Sierra Leone with a degree in business administration by the American University in Beirut. She has worked for Pricewaterhouse in Beirut. In 2006, she moved to Spain, specifically Madrid, to complete her MBA in Instituto Empresa. And once graduated, she started working in the admissions department of Instituto Empresa, currently working as director of international Develop development for Middle East and Africa. She has traveled to nearly 30 countries, leads an eight, a team of 18 located in five countries, managing over 80 uh, stakeholders as a group. And Sabine has also led the Instituto Empresa B2B strategy, including the creation and fostering of connections with key organizations to sign strategic alliances. Sabine, you have the floor for the last intervention. And uh, after that, we will save three minutes for questions and Certainly, we're all looking forward to uh, the ensuing coffee break. So, Sabine, please. Well, thank you. I would like to thank the organizers and certainly Diego for inviting me to be here today. Our story with the African continent started over a decade ago, and I believe it 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 is a match made in heaven, considering the similarities between EA, Africa, and the Spanish culture as has been noticed throughout this conference, with we have a successful history. or But uh, different opportunities require different, more elaborate tools. Our audience here today, well, for those of you who do not know IE, or Instituto Empresa, as it is known in Spain, it was founded in 1973 by a group of Spanish entrepreneurs who wanted to revolutionize entrepreneurship using education. We started off with a business school, but in 2006, we bought an already existing uh, university, the SEC University in Segovia, where we have a traditional campus in the Santa Cruz La Real Convent, which has uh, been uh, declared national, a national heritage site. 
So our uh, graduate students have uh, successful careers and experience in uh, our vertical campus here in Madrid. Today, we offer curricula in different areas other than business, like law, technology, architecture and design, and public affairs, global and public affairs. In the late 90s and along with Spanish companies, we started off our internationalization process. First of all, we expanded, our, we turned our eyes towards the most uh, obvious regions, considering uh, geographic or cultural proximity like Europe and Latin America. And gradually, we started expanding our network of international offices to North America, Asia Pacific, Middle East, and of course, Africa. Today, we have a branch, uh, 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 we have a network of 29 offices across the world. This internationalization was much needed on account of the high talent diversity we found in campus and because it helps us understand the continent not only based on inflows into the continent but also because of Africa's very contribution to our continent and to Spain. Today, over 120 nationalities are represented amongst our students, 26 African nationalities amongst them, and that's in a year of uh, traveling restrictions. We cannot speak of diversity without including Africa, of course, and not only by uh, bringing in African talent for the IE, but also by rolling out an integration mechanism to help students integrate during their studies with the creation of the Africa Club. It's a students club uh, launching several initiatives to promote African culture in Spain. As a matter of fact, this is the 10th year we celebrate the Africa Business Forum. It's a flagship event that attracts speakers from different corners of Africa. When we speak of diversity, we also refer to the integration of content in our curricula and the integration of those contents in all global IE events. It's also a way to expose other international students to the kind of innovation the uh, African mindset can contribute. It's a resilient, solution-oriented, and innovative. Unfortunately, that futuristic of Africa is not the most visible one in the media, and we want to be one of the prescribers of this change in perception. Twelve years ago, IE set his eyes on Africa by expanding our office network in that continent, and that gave us a better understanding uh, and better customization of our offer seen through African eyes to expand our offering in Spain by trying to customize our interaction with the different uh, countries we deal with. So with the years, we've developed several cooperations with different universities in South Africa and Ghana. And well, companies were also vital to truly achieve a transformational impact. So we developed uh, an enterprise network seeking African talent with international background or training. So 50% of African population are women and gender equality, women's empowerment and access to education are key for sustainable economic development in Africa. Considering that and along with our diversity center and other partners, we have developed several initiatives in the past few years like a training and mentoring program for entrepreneur women in six African countries along with EZIT and the first women on board program in the continent with, an, uh, with a women's association in Africa. We want to be part of the transition towards gender equality that uh, uh, Africa is facing right now. The network we've developed in the continent offers us broad opportunities for students, well, mostly well, either African or non-African students to further understand and interact 
with other African countries via our different projects. We have a microfinance project in Ghana, a leadership program in social institutions in South Africa, and another project we're running in Ethiopia. Our interest is attracting the best possible talent regardless the economic situation around them. We do that thanks to the IE Foundation, Foundation which offers several scholarship uh, schemes via individual uh, donors or sponsors to attract that talent to IE and curricula that are part of the demand in the, in the context of the transformation and digitalization the continent is going through. Uh, I cannot say it has been easy. Ultimately, we're talking about 54 highly dispersed, highly diverse, and highly volatile countries without equitable growth because each uh, country is moving at its own pace. Nonetheless, our uh, path has been greatly facilitated by Spanish embassies and business offices in the continent. It's, all, it's been almost three years since we created the Africa Center, a clear proof of our commitment to Africa. The center is meant to revolutionize the way the oncoming generation of executives envisages African innovation. Thanks to this center, we have integrated real-life cases from Africa into our curricula and fostered uh, entrepreneurship and social innovation. Along with the center, we've launched several initiatives by forming a community of agents for change in the continent who drive the sustainable development of Africa, thus uh, fostering the impact of technology. We've also seen a change in the demand for courses which used to traditionally focus on business, and other programs with more access to financing. Students were seeking that international experience on business by living abroad for a while, but the uh, continent was facing drastic, cha dramatic changes, and most students wanted to go back to their country to apply their knowledge and be part of the change. As you know, Africa is an economically and politically volatile region going through a digital transformation that actually affected the demand for studies. African students often fall in love with our country and bring a supplementary vision to it. However, the opportunities for staying are usually limited by European legislation. So the opportunities are out there to facilitate the mobility of African students. And we need a holistic view to go about it, not only in the field of education, but also in terms of contents in our curricula to expose uh, Spain to our neighboring country. Well, thank you, Sabine. Well, we're going into the final stage, uh, a Q&A session. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. Before I give you the floor, I would like to thank our five panel members for their uh, intellectuality and the rigor they have applied to their presentations. I am, I am sure you have uh, brought your own contribution to uh, deepening our academic uh, connections with Africa. Several things have been said here. So I would like to go straight to the core And in, in summarizing, in summarizing in one minute, the marrow of your presentations. First, Beatrice spoke of uh, Erasmus Plus vocational training programs based on two projects uh, funded with two and four million euros. She told us about vocational training, the tasks or the programs 
they have launched uh, in engineering, tourism, sports, employment. And she also spoke of strategy and uh, uh, reaching 600 people in these four years. So that's, that's just a reminder in case you have questions for Beatrice. Then Jose Carlos gave us a, a quick pan view on a CPIA program co-financed by the European Union, Spain-Morocco Synergies. Well, providing education for 100 students and coordinating their uh, travel and logistics in connection with new renewable energy sources like wind, photovoltaic, geothermal. And so culturally training those minds in the technological aspects of, uh, of these components is is now part of the uh, UN-defined international policy as seen in international meetings and uh, uh, the COPs, well, with the recent one in Madrid and then the past ones in Madrid, Durban, etc. So uh, a contribution along those lines is always important. You also made some comments on uh, migrations that I found very interesting. Next, Eduardo, as an expert in uh, entrepreneurial management, working from a private company and with a long-standing 80-year tradition, 50 of them in Africa and in many other countries, can uh, or have acted as a by optimizing the a local uh, cuisine and the local tastes to adapt the the traditional the products traditionally used in that local cuisine. So food culture, a high uh, number of uh, trained professionals, trained in-house. So those were Eduardo's comments in case you have questions for him. Nasara Cabrera, as a representative of the Autonomous Community of the Canary Islands, involved uh, uh, many a practical aspect. And I'm pleased to see that uh, the vice rectors of the two Canarian public universities that uh, work with Nasara in uh, everything pertaining to our, our neighboring uh, continent, Africa. And last, Sabine, a very quick presentation on the role or on the support uh, of the IE Foundation. In Spain, we call it Instituto Empresa rather than IE, but uh, I'll have to uh, follow the trend and start calling it IE. So she told us about the an Alumni Club, uh, 26 countries, uh, and an extraordinary wealth of culture. So with these final brush strokes, I open the floor for uh, questions and comments. We have uh, three minutes to that effect, and here is the microphone. Good morning. I am Indaura Vice Rector of the Las Palmas University. I wanted to congratulate all the speakers. We are, everybody from my university are sending me emails and WhatsApps congratulating all your presentations and they will be very useful for us to design new ideas that will be implemented in our university. Just to make a comment about some of the things we do and uh, that has been the work of more than 15 years in 
the Canary Islands universities, in my case, with projects with the European funding to work in cooperation and research projects in Africa. They were called the Portefex projects, now Interreg MAC projects. Now we have 40 projects with different African countries where we set so many alliances and all the things that you have introduced in your presentations are present. We have the participation of uh, academic institutions from both sides, but also technological institutions, local administrations. And I believe that one day this might be very interesting to come to light and is not really well known for the majority of the public. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Rector of the University Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. Yes, we have um, another question. Hello, good morning. Hola, <laughs> good morning. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Since yesterday, actually, it has been a really fascinating conference. Um, for me, it is a huge discovery um, to see this side of Spanish, uh, Spanish foreign diplomacy and this integration of academia um, into uh, the foreign diplomacy. Um, not so much a, a, a question, the presentations were brilliant and very um, completed one another very much from, uh, you know, uh, vocational training to standard uh, university training to private sector uh, uh, being involved. Um, I, I want to just, a couple of things are sticking out in my head. One is that, yes, the migration problem must be addressed from the source and not from the effects. And I think when we, we put our thinking this way, we begin to find um, innovative uh, solutions. Um, Africans are running away from something and we have to make what they're running from more attractive so that they, they stay. Um, um, the, the, the second element that uh, I wanted to, uh, that really stuck in my mind is the multi-stakeholder approach that most of you are, are using and I think that merits even further discussion. Um, hopefully in our panel this afternoon, we talk more about governments, African governments. I noticed that the Moroccan project seems to be partly successful because it is so strongly supported by the Moroccan government. And uh, we need more governments who are really, really active in these programs with a vision to, to keeping their young people at home and providing uh, opportunity um, for them. And then um, finally, I just wanted to uh, uh, also um, note the, the, the gender component that seems to be also um, cross-cutting in all of the um, programs. There's no African future without African women. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Any of you would like to respond? Yes, they were reflections and not questions. So, okay, thank you. Do we have any other question or comment? The organizers have pointed at me that we shouldn't forget our coffee break. And at 12 o'clock on the dot, we will resume. So we... Thank you very much for your attention and we will be back in a few minutes. Bueno, buenos días. Morning to everyone. Es, uh... We're going to start this dialogue that is undoubtedly one of the very interesting sessions of this seminar. For me, it's an honor to be chairing and sharing this panel with 
two champions of women's rights and the agenda for change and transformation of uh, Spanish and African society from Cameroon, uh, more specifically. My presentation is going to be very limited in this dialogue. We just hope they simply have a dialogue, a discussion those between those two great uh, women, and I will simply introduce them. Maria Teresa Fernández de la Vega, she doesn't need to be introduced in Spain, but uh, would, I would like to highlight uh, part of her long experience as a public uh, figure. She's been working at the three power levels in Spain. She's been an MP. She's also been a member of the General Council of the Judiciary. She's also been vice president of the Spanish government. She's also a university professor. In her experience, the struggle for equality between men and women has always been present in her professional life, especially the work with African women that started in 2006 in the meeting of uh, Spanish and African women for a better world. She promoted these encounters being vice president of the government and shows her commitment to African women, which is the origin of the foundation Women for Africa that she created in 2012, and she is now the president. She is also president of the Council of State, another very relevant public institution. As a diplomat, and in front of many other diplomats here in the room, and uh, I know about Spanish society and about foreign action, and I have to say that the role of Maria Teresa Fernández de la Vega has been key for the evolution towards equality between men and women in Spain, and she's also been key in the increase of the action and presence of Spain in sub-Saharan Africa with visits, trips, opening of embassies, channeling of resources. So Spain and in relation and also our African policy both owe a lot to Maria Teresa de la Vega. Obviously, I'm going to introduce one of the most important voices of African feminism, Mrs. Kakawala from Cameroon, president of the Cameroon People's Party, and also general director, CEO of the consultancy strategy. She's an activist of uh, political participation. She confessed to me this morning that it was difficult for her to move into politics because she is uh, an entrepreneur, although always with a social commitment. In 2012, she founded the movement Cameroon Oboso. In 2011, was the only woman candidate to the presidential elections been on the sixth position out of 23 candidates. She was acknowledged in 2007 by the World Bank as one of the seven entrepreneurial women more influential in Africa and of one of the 150 most influential women in the world by the Newsweek magazine. Maria Teresa Fernández de la Vega and Kawala know each other very well, and that's why I believe they will have a very enriching and fruitful dialogue between both of them. Anyhow, I would like to start by a question to both of them, in your opinion and with your different viewpoints, somebody from Africa and somebody from Europe. What is the importance of higher education 
the access of women and young uh, Africans to higher education in order to increase women's empowerment in their societies so that they can be Come transforming agents for change in their societies. I don't know who would like to start responding to this question because it's for both of you. Microphone, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Uh, first, I would like to thank the diplomatic school for having invited me to this encounter. I would like to say is it wouldn't be a better not because I feel very happy. I know Cab Kala for long. We have worked together. We have shared very interesting uh, debates and discussions, especially in everything that have to do with political leadership of women. And we have a joint project in the Foundation Women for Africa. She's part of our leaders. We have the common challenge to work on the political leadership in Africa that is so important. In order to have uh, political leadership, uh, Mr. Ambassador, education is the key. Education is the key of everything, is the main element for anyone. But if is this the case for everybody, for women is even more important. It's absolutely everything. Education is the only thing that prevents women from being uh, deprived from their rights and liberties. And this education is the only thing that allows women to be autonomous, giving them the resources, the means, and the capacities. So they can have their own criterion with education. They can interpret the reality they live in. And this that is common to everyone, and is true, but for women, it has a strategic value. That is to say, especially the first thing that education gives you is it allows you to open up your eyes to discrimination that we still suffer as women in the world. Uh, the fact that the system, uh, the patriarchal system that is uh, still the dominating model uh, today has given us a subordinated role, subordinated to men. And education gives us the possibility to say, listen, this is not as it should be. And it will not be like this anymore, because already I believe that we're making important progress. And thanks to the possibility of study, learn, relate, share, and all of these is given by education. So this is a revolution that is changing the world. And this is the revolution that will more change the world so that it becomes a better place. Is the rebellion looking for the light, looking for reason, looking for knowledge. Look, and the protagonists are the women. This is, as the poet might say, our weapon full of future and to be able to develop in life a professional career, although at least the one you choose is very important. First, because this is the exercise of our own freedom, and higher education makes this possible. So to be able to access to higher education means everything, means to be the owner of your life, means to be able to choose your own life. And it gives you all and every possibility to do in your life. It allows you to choose your priorities or change them throughout your life if you wish to. Life puts you in different situations. And my friend knows this very well. She is being placed in very difficult situations. And she's tackling them all uh, because she is a well-prepared woman and because we're working so that all women are better educated in Africa to face the difficult situations they have to face, which are not only difficult for them and their countries, but for everybody. Because life is for all of us. If Africa is OK, the world will be OK. If Africa is not doing OK, the same would be said about the rest of the world and Europe or Spain. So it's not only an ethical matter, a problem of 
matter of principles, but of usefulness, analyzing our reality so that the world becomes a better place for all. So education, education, education. Thank you so much. Um, thank you uh, to the organizers also um, for inviting me here. It has, as I said uh, a little bit earlier, it has been really an enlightening um, two days for me. And um, the opportunity uh, to meet uh, Maria Teresa, who is not only a friend, um, but from where I sit, uh, they're not too many people you, you look up to. There are not too many people who serve as uh, role models. And uh, definitely for me, she is uh, a role model and um, somebody who really incarnates, I think, um, what we want to see in women's leadership today. Because it's not just about having a woman in, in, in the leadership space, but it is about transforming power. It's about transforming what you do when you have power. And uh, I think uh, uh, for me, Maria Teresa incarnates this and, and um, enables us to have hope that it is possible uh, what we are trying to achieve in the world. Um, to answer your question, uh, we've had a lot of figures since, since yesterday, a lot of statistics, but I will give you a few more. Um, so Africa is the young, youngest continent. Um, and we will have about 400 million Africans in the workforce uh, by 2025, just tomorrow. Um, out of these, only 6% of them have a university education in comparison to the rest of the world, which is, averages about 26% of the working population. So there's a huge university gap in uh, university education gap for Africa uh, in general. And that gap is even huger for women because we have um, only about 3.6% of African women in that working population have a university degree. And we know from uh, experience and studies around the world, not just in Africa, that a university uh, education immediately increases your income. We know that a university education means healthier families, better educated children. We know that a university education in Africa means that that girl is staying in school longer and we are reducing child marriage. And we know for sure that women spend about 90% of their income on their families. So women use their money to educate their children, to have healthier families, to buy food in the family, and so on. Men spend somewhere between 30 to 40% of their income on their families. So um, automatically, higher education is transforming the community. Um, automatically, we are having a revolution. You know, we could, we could focus on, on getting massive numbers of African women into higher education, and we would definitely transform the societies. And I think one thing that is really key um, is political leadership. Transformation, change, development is not possible anywhere in the world without a political vision. Sometimes in Africa, we want to behave as if this, that, that it's possible. We can invest in private sector or in NGOs or, you know, and that somehow this will be okay. It will not. You need good, strong political vision to be able to develop entire nations, to be able to have achievement on scale. And the question for us then as African women is how do we accede to this political leadership? And I think one of the key ways, um, when I look at the, uh, we have a program um, with uh, the foundation um, that 
uh, is, is the Yale Women Program. And when I look at all the women, there are about 12 of us African women um, from different countries, all at the highest levels of political leadership in, in their countries. We are all university educated. We, are all, we all have that ability to exchange with our peers um, from around the world to be able to imagine a totally different future uh, for Africa. So um, university education is, is uh, it's, 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 it's a key that we cannot do without. Thank you, Mrs. Kawala. Uh, you mentioned political leadership and political will, uh, strong policies. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that? Concrete uh, ideas, both for African societies, African countries, but also for Spain. And regarding Spain, tell us all, tell Maria Teresa, <laughs> what would be your ideas, please? Thank you. Um, Yes, I, uh, uh, again, I mentioned a little bit earlier that I, it's been very interesting for me to have a glimpse into uh, Spanish foreign diplomacy since I've, since I've been here. And um, it is clear today, I'm, uh, one message I want to get across, Africa is in trouble. We are in very, very serious trouble. No one is more preoccupied by that than Africans. Because sometimes I think the rest of the world feels like, you know, <laughs> what are they doing over there? Uh, they don't seem to be worried about these problems. We, we, are, we are extremely worried about where we are as a continent. Um, and in the case of women who are in politics, for the most part, we actually literally put our lives on the line to make these changes happen. Because we live in very, very difficult environments for the most part, being in politics means a physical risk for us. It means a risk for our families. It means a risk for our businesses. And we take that risk because we cannot, we cannot imagine that the path we are on is our future. We absolutely have to create a different future. And what does that mean? Number one is that in Africa, we have to get to the basic bottom line of governance. We have to be able to select leaders by the people. <laughs> they cannot be imposed upon the people. We have to be able to hold leaders accountable. We have to be able to ask for results from our leaders. And we have to be able to change leaders. We are, for many of us, still in a situation where my, in my country, the president has been there for 38 years. Now, even if you're really, really good at a job, <laughs> um, this is a very long, long time. Um, in other countries, since we've been here, I've talked with uh, other colleagues from Guinea, from uh, Ghana, and so on. We still struggle with bringing political, with political change and being able to have accountable leaders. So that is num the, the, the basic bottom line, uh, uh, a struggle and one for rule of law. Now, es una lucha, es una lucha por el Estado de Derecho. She's Spanish, I don't hear. <laughs> I bet. Um, so, um, Yes, yeah, so, so, but in terms of policies, um, the, I, I, I think this, what, what we're seeing here since yesterday, the idea of saying how can we cooperate, create opportunity in Africa. We want our, it is heartbreaking for us when our young people leave. It tears apart, apart families. We, our community uh, are weaker because our young people are leaving. So we need ways to keep them at home. Keeping them at home means providing a minimum. It means providing water and electricity. It means providing schools. It means providing jobs. And so to me, the policies that we need to be looking at are policies with the rest of the world 
on how can we create the jobs we need in Africa. 20 million Africans enter the job market every year. Africa has 3 million jobs for them. So we have also this massive group of people who are in the informal sector, so they've created jobs for themselves. They are extremely dynamic, extremely creative, extremely innovative. One of the policy challenges for African countries is, is converting this informal energy, much of it entrepreneurial, into more decent jobs, into more formal jobs. And that, I think, is a key element for cooperation. We've been talking here about training. We've been talking about university e education. It has to be geared towards those kinds of problems in Africa. Um, African women, of course, dominate the informal sector. Um, and, and show, the, f the first time I worked with, with market women, I was completely blown away. Their workday starts at 3 a.m. in the morning and, and, and ends at about 5 p.m. every single day. They show an extraordinary, extraordinary knowledge of their markets, of the ability to master supply chains, of the ability to adapt to, the, to a market that is changing. So they have knowledge, they have experience, they have skills. In Africa, one of the key policy changes needs to be to look at informal people working in the informal uh, sector as skilled people. We call them unskilled. <laughs> this is untrue. So we have to, to, to look at their skills, understand their skills, and say, how are we guiding and converting this into more formal activity for, for the society? So um, uh, there's an enormous amount of work to be done at government and policy level. I absolutely share everything Koch has said. And I was, I was sitting here thinking about something that happened to us in the past. Uh, you may remember this during a trip. While being in Senegal, I requested a meeting with the Senegalese COE. And I asked them to summon uh, entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs. Do you remember that? So we had a meeting, an impressive meeting with entrepreneurs. These were not small entrepreneurs. We were talking about medium size and even large enterprises. And whilst talking to them to understand their needs, someone from the panel where I was sitting with the ambassador and the, uh, the hot shots of the COE said, tell them about microcredit because uh, they will surely be interested in those. And I said, well, I will bring it up, but we should hear them first because that's probably not what they want. And that's exactly what happened. So obviously we brought up micro loans and they immediately stood up and said, we don't want microcredit, we want access to credit with a capital C. But obviously that takes a certain amount of training and that's what we need uh, to uh, get across. Were those voices heard? I don't think so. And I don't believe the Senegalese CEO launched any training courses for those women who already know what they're about to show them how, can, how they really can access credit to uh, generate uh, further production and be a part of the entrepreneurial fabric. They were already there. They had struggled. They already had a small business, but they, they couldn't go any further. So we need to invest. The ambassador was asking, what can we do? Well, we can invest and we can invest on women. And what do we need to do that? Just listen to them, look at them. See where they are, listen to their needs. And reading reality in, involves imagining solutions. We sit together and in one afternoon we can come up with 20 projects. Is that correct, Ka? Well, we can come up with 20 projects because we're there, because we're working on aspects like, say, fisheries. 
We've done some impressive work, if I may say so, in the north of Morocco for uh, fishery uh, cooperatives because we brought our flagship uh, vessel to work with women on fisheries uh, cooperatives. And that goes all the way up to the top researchers. We actually have a network of nearly 100 researchers, female researchers, at the top level, because that's the other Africa we need to know. Whenever we talk about women and women's issues, we are talking about small entrepreneurs, but this lady sitting right here is a very powerful one, and there are so many others like her. Well, for instance, here's the director of the scientific training program, and when we called the program Women research, Do Research. I went to visit the big directors of research centers in Spain, and they were telling me, what are you talking about? Well, I want to set up a program of women researchers, and I want to bring these women here. And their answer was, we don't know any top-notch female scientist in Africa. And I said, well, that's your problem, but I'm bringing them here. And here they are. And here there are a hundred of them. We have a network of a hundred top-notch scientists under grants and scholarships, and our research centers are delighted to have them. I was in the Canary Islands the other day, for instance. There's one in the Astrophysics Center. Can someone cope with the idea that there's a top-notch astrophysicist in Zambia coming to the Canary Islands with the grant for her research project. Nobody even thinks about it. They can't see it because we're stuck to stereotypes and we need to do away with our cliches about Africa. We need to bring these women here and make them known and give them a voice and a face. And we bring them. They're, they're here because they, they always go back. As a matter of fact, at some point when we've had meetings with journalists, uh, somebody asked uh, this uh, uh, scientist, but do you intend to go back to Africa? And uh, her reply was, I never left Africa. I'm only here to study, but I'm, I'm certainly going back. My family is there. My interests are there, and I'm making myself ready to work there. It's offensive because we, as women, always come back home. And I'm speaking in the first person here because that's the actual reality of migration led by women. And that's exactly what's happening in Africa today. So investing on women is our safest bet because we're not only investing money in scientists, we're investing in fisheries, businesses. Well, we have a super powerful business network too. These women didn't study here, but actually they went to the US to study and I supervise that. So we need to change our mindset, Ambassador. There are top-notch quality entrepreneur women in Africa. You just have to look for them. And you need to set that as a precedent for African young women so that their, uh, their role models are not only European women. They need to look up to their mothers, their aunts, their grandmothers, who are the leaders of their community. That's a role model to look up to. Just like me, well, I had an aunt who was a doctor, and she, she had a hard time uh, making herself distinguished in her profession, and she became a leader. So it's important to have those role models. Because when we invest on, on these women, and making these women known, we're not only investing on skilling people, we're investing on democracy. We're investing on cohesion, stability. Our money goes to giving Africa a future of Pacific progress. And wealthy progress, too, because that continent is teeming with resources, sometimes misexploited. But Let's do something. Let's put the women up ahead. Let's put women on top. I'm not saying it's easy to do. It's not, it's not easy even here. And women have had a hard time reaching this diplomacy school. It's never been easy for women anywhere. But now we're everywhere. Well, we 
have to do the same thing in Africa, but to do that, we need to see these women and analyze their realities. There are thousands of papers from international bodies on the benefits of equality. We have tons of paper about this, but we don't have as many projects that are specifically addressed to uh, furthering that equality and helping women. And that's precisely what we need to do. This gender perspective thing is old news. We're tired of gender perspective. We want gender equality. We don't want to. We have enough perspective. Perspective is a word. Don't give me perspective. Put me on the project. That's where I want to be. And that's what we need to do. And that's where we need to change things. And it's not that hard, is it? It's very easy because we have an excellent relationship, don't we, Ka? Don't we? We're friends already. Put it in our hands. We'll get it going, won't we? If I put you in charge in Cameroon, of setting up a project for all women in your country who need to take the leap in education, going from nurses to doctors. Well, obviously, you have to be a nurse first and then become a doctor. Well, that's something you have to invest on, right? We have to invest on the fundamental rights of individuals, and that includes the right to health and sanitation and a dignified life. That's where we need to put our chips, and that's why we're investing on science, because all those female scientists do go back, and they do come back with a serious uh, international network to back them up. And they're publishing, and they're well-known, and they're the best. And now it's beginning to look normal, right? Well, let's keep working along that path. That's our commitment as a country. I believe my government is fully committed to that. I'm telling you, Ka, I think we are. And therefore, I believe we're, we're supporting these matters uh, more strongly. We've been reasonable so far, but we want to do more. And I want to insist on these uh, researchers and graduates, these women who come to Spain, these political leaders who come to prosperous Europe and publish their articles in wealthy Europe. They're seen. They're the stars of international uh, media. And they receive offers to stay, and they don't because I'm sure you've received many offers to stay here. But none of them, none of these women decide to stay in Europe. And that's very important when you invest your money because we're investing on the ground. We're investing in Africa. And that's, some, that's a lesson Europe has not learned yet. The EC, with all their resources, will have never received a single dime from them. We've never received a single dime from the EC. Well, maybe we will get a eventually get a project. We're not getting any so far. We have no idea who's getting those projects. Nor do I want to know. But well, that's the that's the way the cookie crumbles. I've never received a dime from Europe, Ka. I'm telling you. But there are enormous resources with unknown destinations. There's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of red tape, and there's a lot of big words and changing a comma in a document. And then for the next tender, who goes, who the project goes to. And that's what's happening in actuality. And I'm, I'm not only talking about Spain, I'm talking about the whole European Union. And it's part of our experience. I'm not making things up. We have people from the foundation who can uh, who can vouch for what I'm saying, and we've discussed this a number of times. So there are plenty of things we can do, and things we can improve. If we only did four new different things, we can change reality. We can change the reality of so many people. I can't say we're changing the world, but we're beginning to introduce different realities into it. And I, I do believe that's the best path. I don't know a better one. We've tried so many things with patience and time. And we now know that we need to go straight to the marrow of women's issues. There are 
millions of available young and not so young women who are willing to improve their own status and grow their skills to make a contribution to their societies, not only in terms of growth and wealth, but also in terms of stability, cohesion, democracy. But we have to start with the public space. I am a big believer of the of the of public spaces and the state. So we have to start there. State policies to generate public policies which are so important in Africa because uh, not only do they generate greater cohesion but uh, they also entail a certain behavior among citizens. Democracy, respect, ambassador, you know how important all those factors are. Look at the recent issues in Senegal, because you need to do things not only for economic growth, but also for economic, for uh, social and, polit and uh, political cohesion. And, well, when you do it, it works, and we can see that in Cameroon. Here is the best example you can find. This lady sitting next to me has uh, 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 sent a letter to the Security Council along with uh, other women. They're trying to uh, break her the hurdles, to overcome the hurdles, to get people to look to Cameroon. Hey, listen, we're here. We exist. We have skills. We have women. And I know she will put it in better words, but how how many things would you implement if we let you? Hey, here are some euros for you to launch a program. Tell us about it. What would you do? Thank you so much, uh, Maria Teresa. I think um, getting to the, the, the marrow, uh, I totally agree with you that as a world, we spend far too many too much time and resources on discussions on paperwork and on uh, um, things which which do not get these these results um, I am thinking about uh, just uh, Maria Teresa is referring to a letter uh, two letters that were sent by 20 Cameroonian women leaders um, to the IMF and to the UN Security Council um, the, the letter to the IMF, we have requested that the IMF should not give our country any more money until our government is able to account for the, the money it took last year for, to manage COVID, um, which was stolen for the, for the most part. Um, and uh, what a revolutionary idea, right? Don't give any more money to the people who stole it <laughs> until you figure out uh, uh, what's going on. But I think that um, this possibility that we have created and opened up to advocate at the, the highest international level for the well-being of our countries um, is the kind of uh, th these are the kind of uh, projects, programs, which don't require a whole lot of money, actually. Um, just the possibility to be able to do it, um, that I think women all over Africa would have something to say about um, the way their countries are being run and the relationships. We wrote to the IMF because, you know, people said, well, well, you're not the government. Well, you're not. Well, we are the taxpayer and we are paying back the IMF loan. So we felt very comfortable writing to the IMF. If I have to pay, pay back the loan, I should have something to say about how that money is being used. Um, so this kind of advocacy at very high levels for, for African women um, is something that could be interesting. We are, we are doing it, it for the first time, um, and uh, it created quite some national and international uh, uh, news. Um, but I, I definitely think it is a path to, uh, to explore. I want to get back to a couple of concrete programs and, and, and policies. I think uh, we have talked about the importance of creating opportunity in Africa um, for African young people. We also have to talk about the fact that, um, you know, there's a lot of news in, uh, in Europe about uh, migrants who come 
by the sea and, and, and so on. There's less news about the doctors and the nurses that Europe takes from us, right? Um, we have about 13,000 doctors in the US trained in Africa working today in the United States. My country alone, Cameroon, has over 3,000 engineers in Germany alone. So there is a, a huge amount of talent um, from the African con uh, continent, which is being um, courted and, and recruited. You are absolutely right. I have received some amazing job offers <laughs> uh, to be able to, 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 to go and work uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, so I think the reality is that, especially when you talk about certain sectors such as health, um, such as uh, engineering, which, by the way, Africans are good at, we are very good at the hard skills, not the soft skills, marketing, uh, customer relations, a little bit tougher for us, but science, astrophysics, and so on. Uh, we, we happen to mathematics, we happen to do extremely well in. Um, and, and I think we have to get to the point today of, as a world of thinking about how do we share these resources. Um, it, we should move from the either or, either the person is, is, is living in Europe and only contributing to that society, or uh, they stay in Africa and um, they probably don't have a very good salary, they may be worried about the healthcare and the education and so on for their children. I, um, in my political party, we put forward a program which would be something sort of like a reverse Peace Corps, uh, a reverse possibility for people to be able to come home and volunteer or work at a very uh, low uh, 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 salary for anywhere from three months to two years and be able to get the satisfaction because that is what is lacking for them in Europe is the satisfaction of contributing to their communities, is the satisfaction of building something, is the network of a family and a community and a culture. And why not think about programs that would enable somebody um, uh, and, and uh, some NGOs already doing this, is would enable a, a medical doctor in Europe, an African medical doctor in Europe, to be able to come to Africa and work on specific programs for three months, for six months, for two years. For us, uh, as a political party, we feel that you would get a short-term benefit out of this, you would get a medium-term benefit, which is, of course, the sharing of knowledge and, and experience, and for sure you would get a long-term be benefit because a certain percentage would like it and decide to stay and, and, and decide to come back home. So um, I think we need to be thinking about policies that enable us to share um, uh, resources. Another uh, element that is very important is remittances. So uh, many people do not know that the amount of money that Africans in Europe and uh, uh, the United States in the, in the West in general send home is, is far superior to development aid. In, in some countries it is double, in some countries it is three times the amount of development aid that the country is getting. However, this money right now is just going direct Kawala sends money to her brother. Kawala sends money to her, for her mother's health care. So for us, we think if we could channel re, uh, remittances to local governments where they would be working on community projects. So instead of Kawala paying every six months for her mother's health care and usually her mother, that means it's because her mother has to go to the capital city to get her treatment and so on, is that you would, I would find uh, uh, 20 kawalas or, or, or 50 kawalas who would say, hey, in this community, can we improve the health, the, the, the health services in this community? Can we improve the education? This is, this is already being done timidly by individuals, but we think if you, if you put it into public policy, if you're thinking about pub, public policy in this way, then, 
once again, you can channel this huge amount of money which comes to, uh, to Africa from Africans um, into development projects that actually you know, improve the lifestyle um, for entire communities. So I think uh, I would just say globally that together and, and, and remittances, for example, one simple thing needs, that needs to be done is that Africa is the most expensive place to send money to in the world. Uh, so these, these Africans who, who have to send money home are being uh, uh, milked by um, uh, private companies uh, simply because they want to transfer money to, to their families. So something needs to happen on the Western side in terms of policy to just make it cheaper <laughs> to, 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 to get the money there. Um, and on the African side, we need to have policy that enables us to channel that enormous amount of money into development projects instead of just individuals um, being uh, are being assisted, and it, and it could also go into investment funds to be able to have uh, local economic development and have uh, 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 companies that are um, are created. But I think basically what we've we've heard here over the last two days is that we need to change our thinking. You know, we are we are in a mode where. Uh, Europe is defending its shores, you know, don't, don't, don't come, don't come, don't come. Uh, Africans are desperately trying to find a way, uh, a, 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 a way in through any nook and, 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 and cranny. And we absolutely just need to switch our thinking around to think about how can we create the opportunity uh, locally, how can we accompany people? Some very nice examples here uh, since yesterday on this mobility of, and, and also we are now in a new age where people are going to be mobile. I cannot say to, an, to a young African, don't go to Europe. He looks at me and says, well, you go there six times a year. Why should I stay <laughs> here, right? And, and I enjoy coming to Europe. I enjoy, it's, it's important for me to have this exchange that I'm having with you. I go home with new ideas and with new uh, ways of thinking. So we are in a world where people are going to be mobile. We have to figure out ways where it is safe for them to do so and that we can do that with dignity. Es, estoy seguro de que estas eh, interesantísimas I am sure that these very interesting messages have generated some questions in uh, our audience and perhaps we could use a few minutes to address questions uh, to our two panel members If you would like to say something please raise your hand and uh, a microphone will be brought to you Good afternoon, Álvaro Lombriz from the Association of Scientists, Men and Women, a Spanish scientist in South Africa. Just to say that uh, very humbly that I fully agree with everything was said about the quality and quantity of uh, women scientists doing science for Africa and about African matters from our association since our creation. We have been promoting or announcing the program Day Research, that's the name of the program, Day Research, and I would like to offer our support from the South of Africa in the list of uh, South African women scientists that uh, once they come back they might have a point of entry. Uh, they will be both Spanish and South African when they come back. That's our idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, you, you. Now we have your number. The director of the program Day Research, and uh, and thank you for this offer and that we. Uh, Sincerely thank all collaborations are important for us. So thank you again. Yes, it is important to promote. What do we have to do? 
What do we have to do to promote these women scientists? Well, promote them. And how can we promote them? Well, supporting them, supporting them so that on their coming back home, they will stay in touch because of a network. And now there is an association of um, women scientists, the members of their research. They are also in contact with our network. And they need to be supported when they come back. Uh, they all have projects in their countries of origin. So they now come back to their countries after having received an extraordinary education in the research centers named Severo Ochoa, which are about the best in the world. So they didn't only get local education, but also they had been in touch with the European network of scientists and in science to be in a network that's key. The science is fed of Africans uh, themselves. Those women scientists are just uh, state of the art. I love to speak about them. I feel very proud of them. And because nobody believed me when I started saying this, but now we have around 200. So we see that there is also this other Africa. And this program is probably the one that better expresses how much can be done because there are women scientists. And if we do a program for engineers, we might get engineers from all over Africa and also of experts in agriculture. And we have them. Maybe is best known the most manual works, but we also have scientists. We have political leaders. We have uh, scientist leaders. So. How do we promote them? Well, promoting them, uh, being with them, listening to them, getting to know them, and they can do incredible things because they never give up. And that's something that I just really admire. We had, when we went to pick up a scientist, we sometimes they come with two babies here on their shoulders. And they spend their time in their hotel room. We don't really know what they do, what she does with the babies, but babies are there. Uh, but the first time we saw a scientist with the baby, we, we were really shocked. But there they were with their babies. They finished their work, and they came back to their families. And that's very important for us to understand. And as Kawala said, there are many different avenues, many different possibilities. But to cooperate with Africa, the first we have to do, the first thing is to look at Africa, to get to know Africa, to understand African problems. And then it's very easy to know that women entrepreneurs do not want micro loans. They want access to real uh, credits and they need to be trained in financial entities or instruments so that they can really see what are the difficulties they might encounter or their companies might encounter and what are the things, the information they should provide so they can be or they can have an important loan that will allow them to transform their company as is the case in Western Europe. And that's very easy. They just need this training. and. So it's not what we think. We always need to contrast what we think with the African needs. They have their needs very clear and their priorities very clear. So you're not going to find a question unanswered. When you ask, what do you need? They know what they need. The problem is that they don't have the resources to access what they need. And that's where cooperation should be heading to, we should all change. Life has changed, the world has changed, and Africa has changed. And things, we're always learning, of course, to do things differently. We learn every day. And so why don't we just listen to them? I've learned from her, from listening to her. And that's the key of the success of women for Africa. They are the success, not us. They had been our masters, our teachers. 
and they, and sometimes men, but usually women. Please, could anybody indicate the chairperson to turn on his microphone, please? Yes. My, I was inviting you whether you would like to add anything that uh, you have in your mind, in your papers, uh, before I, 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 I make the closure and the final words. Um, I would just like to say thank you. Uh, I think uh, I have uh, really um, learned a lot over the last two days. And as I said, I'm going home. Uh, my um, my brain is spinning a little bit with uh, <laughs> a lot of ideas. Um, uh, Cameroon is, is, a, is a curious country where, where Spain is concerned because uh, we, are a, we were colonized by both the English and the French. Um, and uh, we choose Spanish. Spanish is the third uh, most spoken language in um, in, in Cameroon, most spoken foreign language in, in Cameroon. So uh, Cameroonians choose to learn Spanish in, the, in, the, in, in, in school. And um, for me, it has been eye-opening because I knew very little uh, before coming here about Spanish cooperation, about uh, some of these ideas. And um, I, I definitely have a new uh, um, possibility open in my, in, my, uh, in my mind with regard to uh, cooperation with, with, with Spain. And so um, thank you to, to all of the speakers. Um, thank you very much to Maria Teresa. She, she, she gave an order to the ambassador to meet me when he came to Cameroon. And I think that's partly why I'm sitting here today. <laughs> So this, uh, uh, this um, uh, promotion is also um, just making women visible, as she has, as she has said. Just bringing, uh, uh, we have a tremendous amount of talent on our continent. And um, just making it seen sometimes is all that it takes. So thank you very much. It's been a wonderful moment. was a question and I think I have ignored it without realizing it. So we have two questions, in fact. Because I was listening so carefully to both panelists, I didn't take into account the audience. Thank you very much, um, Maria and Ms. Kawala, for your very, very interesting and revealing uh, uh, presentations. Um, since you're talking about um, knowledge and changing perspectives with regards to Africa, um, I would like also to draw the attention of people here that um, Africa, devoid of the perception of the West, must also come to the point that we are seen as um, a geographical tapestry. We have individual countries in the continent. Because um, throughout the presentation in the past two days, it's been sometimes talking directly to Africa and sometimes talking directly to Morocco and some countries. I am an African, and it's sometimes very, very depressing to live with the stereotype of an African. When you know you come from Ghana, and Ghana as a country has a different ambition and aspiration to, say, Cameroon. So, when policies are geared towards Africa, I think by the spirit of knowledge we all seek to um, gather here, we should start looking at individual countries somehow beyond the stereotypes because um, if, you meet, if I met a Sudanese, for instance, as an African, there are differing cultural um, similarities. He would do things I would not understand even as an African. So if the West perceive us as one and put us together, sometimes a little discomforting and quite depressing. Um, that is what I want to say. Thank you. 
I suggest you not to be depressed. Diversity is a fact in Africa, as diversity is a fact in Spain. So what you're conveying, I can convey to you from my own country. Here, somebody from the north, a Basque, is very different from an Andalusian, and they are both Spanish. So we have a diverse and plural Spain. So really, in Spain, we understand plurality and diversity in Africa. Of course, there is diversity and plurality in Africa. But, uh, all countries are different. But they are all part of an African continent, sharing some common specificities, as there are things in Spain which are common to all Spaniards. So what we have to speak always is about diversity, but enriching diversity. Diversity is always enriching. And uh, this plural and diverse Africa is a wealth in itself. And uh, I don't think we consider all Africans the same. I can speak about the huge differences between the North and the South and within the South or within the same country sometimes. And that diversity is good and we should learn to live with this and not to have any complex in saying what we need to be saying. Maybe we're not doing such a great job and we can do it better. But anyhow, I believe that do not be depressed. We Spanish, we know that Africa is a plural continent and a very diverse continent. And sometimes they ask me, what do you like most about Africa? And I say, well, it's impossible to say what I like most about Africa because there are so many things and in different places that it will be impossible for me to choose one. I can speak about different countries, and that's wonderful. So please, don't be depressed, because uh, there are other things much more serious. And uh, to defend diversity and plurality, I totally agree with you. That's wealth, that's richness, and that's good for everybody. And of course, don't have any doubt that in Spain we really understand very well about diversity and we are very respectful to it because this is a reality in our own country. If the organizers allow any more questions, because we are a bit behind, but I believe there are questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for this inspiring and enriching dialogue. I feel full of energy now to go on working. I just wanted to introduce a topic and listen to your viewpoints about it, something that we didn't really discuss in this seminar. Uh, and I think it's important because it's an academic uh, cooperation seminar. Yesterday, we had the presentation by Pule Lenka Ula, Vice Rector from a South African university. It was the first women in this position. It will be very important due to the importance and how much we share the importance of higher education to promote the continent, to promote um, and consolidate the achievements that sometimes are fragile in some places to promote women's empowerment. I believe it will be very important to speak more about how to support women leadership within academic institutions, the power within the academic institutions, and how to develop programs through international cooperation that might enhance this process of leadership in the academic institutions of African countries. Just, um, just this, um, just to listen. How can we do it? How can we support this possibility? Microphone, microphone, please. We are already trying to promote this scientific leadership. And we are making steps in this direction with the crew in Spain to see how can we support the young students. 
that come here to do masters and doctorate courses here in Spain. More than 200 people have already come here to conduct these masters and doctorate courses. Then they have to come back to their universities to continue if they want to pursue a scientific career or they and for this is very important intra university cooperation intra institutional cooperation cooperation between un spanish universities and african universities this is work in progress we have already set a task force with the crew to try to tackle this precisely this sub subject and there are some universities some of the rectors of the spanish universities within this task force that are members of this to see what are the instruments or the means needed or the type of program we should follow to implement this. We already have some cooperation with some Moroccan universities. There will be a meeting of scientific women in Mohammed VI University next year. So it's not only us, is we need to work with institutions on both sides. So from the public space, here, CRUE here and the CRUE from Morocco and then the network of African rectors will see how can we work in order to have programs and projects to reinforce the leadership of uh, young students that want to follow an academic or research career in their own countries because this is also high level cooperation. Maria Teresa has just said. Um, I think working w once again within cooperation uh, programs, um, having a gender policy within the program um, enables that discussion to be brought to the table where in some African countries it's not yet on the table. So uh, bringing it on the table opens up the discussion and gives the opportunity uh, to women uh, uh, academics. I come from a country where women's literacy is almost equal to men's literacy. Um, and um, yet, you still, the discussion is still, where are the women? Oh yes, we, we really want women, but where are they? We, we can't see them, we don't know where they are. Um, there's a Cameroonian uh, woman academic who just published um, profiles of 100 women who could occupy leadership positions in the country because she was tired of hearing this uh, uh, discourse of, of where are the women. So I think, you know, introducing it into bilateral discussions uh, when you come to talk about cooperation, having specific uh, um, gender components and gender quotas. I'm a firm believer in quotas um, to, to break down walls. Um, is a way that um, this could uh, be brought to the table and open up doors. Because once again, the women are there. Um, sometimes they needed a little help in, in opening up the door so that they can um, show up at the, at, at the table. And uh, I do have to say that um, in the discussions we heard here for the last two days, there seemed to be a good uh, awareness of, of this element of the component. I heard uh, programs which are uh, targeting parity in terms of uh, participation and um, so on. Behind, but I have a question. At the beginning of the conversation, you have talked about the importance of how power is transforming and Kawala mentioned the problems that the rule of law may have in Africa. The question is, we spoke about the importance of scientific women, entrepreneurial women. How can we do so that uh, African women are more present in politics? If you should give the answer, because you know more about this. I'm sure I agree. Um, I think 
uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I was the first woman to run for the Office of President of the Republic for, in Cameroon. Um, just my presence, I ran in 2011. Till today, little girls walk up to me on the street and they're like, my president, my president, I'm going to be president, you know, and, and so um, visibility is important. And um, having programs where um, African political women leaders have training, have the possibility to do media, have the possibility um, to work on issues of policy um, are all important. Um, supporting uh, existing women leaders so that they can create space for themselves and for other women um, in their societies is extremely um, important. Um, I think that what, what many people do not know is that in, I think, the, 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 the greater part of sub-Saharan Africa, our history, pre-colonial history, is that women are in governance. We are, we are one of the traditions that um, conceives governance as being um, both male and female. In, my, in, in the part of Cameroon that I come from, in the traditional governance setup, from the family head all the way to the village chief, there is no position of power where you don't have a man and then his female counterpart. So there are things in African history that we have lost. Many Africans do not know this. <laughs> um, so there are things in African history that we have lost. Um, in, our, in my movements with women, we start teaching about women's leadership from our tradition. To, to demonstrate that this is nothing Western, this is nothing uh, foreign or imported. Um, this is the way that our an ancestors conceived power. Um, and so there is work to be done with women historians who can uh, do the research and tell the story um, with women who are involved in culture and in the arts who can you know, put this into um, movies and books and plays and so on, um, so that we understand that the the um, uh, uh, the the Egyptians were the first people to have a gendered notion of power, and you see that gendered notion of power in African traditional societies today. People no longer understand the concept of it. Uh, they see it and they don't get why uh, it is like that. Um, I'm looking at my Ghanaian uh, colleagues there who have an, an, an extremely powerful history of women um, in, in, in power. You remember the, the Black Panther movie? Oh, everybody saw Black Panther and you know the, the Dora Milaje, the, the, women, uh, the, the, the women soldiers in that movie are inspired by the, the women soldiers of Benin um, from 14th century. So we have a strong, strong tradition of women in power in African governance. We did not conceive of governance as a male uh, domain. Um, I, I often like to say that before colonialism, we had a gender gap that was like this. After colonialism, it was like this. So um, there are many elements in our own history um, that we can draw from, and uh, I think we need, you know, people need support because that kind of work is, is is not going to find financing in in, in Africa. So uh, we need that kind of support because people have to see power and conceive of power um, as being female. Um, otherwise, they will not, you know, women will not step into it. Um, but uh, we can, I'm, I'm willing to come back for us to have a whole conference about transforming power from a gendered perspective. <laughs> Everything you said, and it's true that there is an African history of feminist women that is very ancient. 
Africa is a woman in its history. So the solution is always the same, education and culture. Education and culture are the most transforming elements, but culture through the public uh, space. The public has the possibility, the political possibility to support. We just have to urge the private, private entities to do uh, their, their role in setting reference of parity, especially if you, then you will have women on the scene. So I repeat, education is key and then reference. And that's carried out either through a television series, everybody watches those series. The media are a very powerful uh, way to change cultural policies. And uh, I have a project, I hope we will have a project in Women Per Africa that is a dream and is halfway through to make a series with uh, powerful women so that it reaches everybody that's key for the young generation. So they have models inviting them to say, yeah, well, if you want to be like her, you need to study or all of this has also been the case in our country, of course. I'm very old now, but uh, uh, when I studied, there was no television. So anyway, the media have always been important reference, portraying models of good women, a good barrister, a good lawyer that can sort out all the problems. And that's done through education and culture from the public domain always from the public domain. So the private space may also have a role, but the responsibilities of the public domain. Apparently, the more we listen to Kawala and Maria Teresa, the more we want to, and how impacted we are by their powerful messages. And that's something that is, uh, been present in their conversation. We should listen to African women. I believe that the lack of visibility of women is a historic tool used by the patriarchy in all societies, maybe less in the African historic societies. We should acknowledge this. And this has to do with the neo-colonial culture or colonial culture of Europe in relation to Africa to make women invisible, not only women, but all Africans. So I believe education will change this, but what we really need to change through education, and not only education, is our minds, our mentalities, as we've heard. Those that have uh, some small power from the administrations or the governments or private companies or academic institutions, we are obliged to make a specific measures. And during the last two days, we've seen examples. And Kawala, that has been following the seminar and has been with us yesterday and today, has been a witness of this, how companies highlight in their presentations, the percentage of women in the middle management or senior management in their companies in Africa, the percentage of women that are in projects of vocational training. And so many compared to the, to the past. Uh, and I believe that this is the best uh, impulse. And in the words of Kawala and Maria Teresa, there is still much to do. My sincere thanks to both of you. Muchísimas gracias, Alberto. Y bueno, 
Yo creo que vamos a la, la well, we don't have a lot of time left, so I believe we will skip the conclusions which are already in written and uh, upload them so that you can read them in your own time so that we can go straight into the closing session. Thank you for your patience. Before we start the closing session, I would like to thank everyone who participated in the seminar. Obviously, our speakers today, Kawala, who came all the way from Cameroon and made important contributions yesterday and today, and certainly Maria Teresa Fernanda de la Vega, a beacon in our work and a role model for many. So thank you very much to the two of you for your contributions. Before I close, I would like to thank the technical team for uh, the great work they've done. I would like to thank the interpreters and uh, the teams that work in organizing the logistics for this seminar. Pepe Alfonso, Juan Jaime, Jose Carlos, your entire team. And as for myself, I would like to personally thank Carmen, who has uh, been with us from the very beginning and who has definitely shaped this event. And I also wanted to thank Mencia, Alejandra, and uh, our uh, intern, Alejandra, as well, and everyone else for your contributions. I think it's been a very interesting seminar. And if we have only achieved to make you aware of how important cooperation with Africa is, I believe we have uh, achieved our goal. Let's hope other seminars will follow suit. Thank you very much, everybody. Allow me to start by thanking all panel members, moderators, speakers, and attendants for their participation, particularly our international friends who have traveled all the way from Africa to join us in this first seminar on academic cooperation. I would also like uh, to thank everyone following the seminar online. For the past two days, we have taken a journey through the different stages African students uh, follow when they come to Spain, from getting a visa issued to the job opportunities they find at the end of their exchange programs. Several aspects of academic cooperation between Africa and Spain have been tackled, including the teaching of Spanish as a second language and the importance of vocational training in the African context. As you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is a, a key priority for Spanish foreign policy, which is reflected both in the third African plan and in the Africa Focus document, which uh, lands all of our priorities, strategic priorities for the African continent into very specific actions. Africa is undergoing a deep transformation, and in the next few years, the changes they're experiencing today will have a direct impact on our own country. Academic cooperation is a fundamental uh, tool that will help us continue to work jointly with the entire African continent towards a shared sustainable development as it promotes a mutual knowledge, contributes to the development of countries, and allows uh, the articulation between education and the internationalization of our businesses. The mobility of African students is uh, currently the highest in the world considering their exponential demographic growth, which necessarily involves an, an increase in demand for uh, higher studies, graduate and postgraduate. And we can only expect this demand to continue growing, not only because of the saturation we can expect in local universities, but also because of the uh, prestige of uh, foreign degrees like the ones offered in Spain. For these reasons, scholarship and exchange programs 
programs as well as mobility assistance programs are increasingly important in our framework. Just a few pieces of data. In 2020, African students made up 10% of the entire uh, world students' mobility. In the case of Nigeria alone, this uh, is a symptom, uh, or it is a symptom that out of the 1.4 million registered students, over 70% studied abroad. And in Cameroon, out of a total of 245,000 students, 23,000 did their studies abroad, followed closely by Ghana. Africa is uh, determined to play a major role in that uh, will soon overtake the mobility of Asian students. And Spain needs to open itself as a, a linguistic and uh, education uh, option for these students. Spain has the indubitable uh, advantage of having a broad geographic presence in the south of Africa. For Spain, academic cooperation is a fundamental path towards some of the objectives around which the recently published African focus revolves, like the development of inclusive and sustainable economies, regional integration, the struggle against climate change, the uh, fostering of uh, commerce and trade, and the presence of Spanish businesses in Africa, as well as fundamental aspects like uh, parity, the empowerment of women and girls, and other equally important objectives that we need to migrate correctly, like mobility and migration, so that we can all cooperate against uh, irregular migrations to move towards an orderly, legal, and most of all, safe immigration. All these elements have been present during these two days showing a high degree of uh, connectivity between education, development, and gender equality, and even migrations. So I am deeply recognizant of your participation, and I expect that uh, your, the thoughts you have expressed here will have a continuity and will become actions in the future so that we can move ahead together in this important aspect of our foreign policy. Thank you once more. Congratulations on uh, the seminar outcome, successful outcome, and I expect to see you again very soon in a new edition of this uh, academic meeting. Clausura, llamo a Alfonso Gentil, por favor, a la tril. Alfonso and uh, José Segura, I would invite you to the forefront. Good afternoon, everyone. I will try to make this uh, closing uh, remarks as short as possible. I would like to thank the Diplomacy School, the uh, Foreign Affairs Ministers, the House of Africa for uh, co-organizing this event. And I insist on the words of our Secretary of State when she says that our cooperation with Africa is one of our a major point of action. And this meeting will serve to further insist on this specific objective. I've only been at the head of CPIA for four months today. But uh, in the past, I have worked on the internationalization of higher education emerging from Spain. Certainly, we've had several meetings and a few trips to Africa. But uh, we, it had never been seen as a priority before. Perhaps it's a, a mea culpa about uh, the past, this statement. But uh, mostly, I believe that we can still change direction and uh, place our chips on a, a prosperous 
wealthy continent where women need to have a more preeminent role, well, they already have it, but we have to understand it. And we have to foster mobility, not only for students to come to our universities, but also to help them enrich their own communities of origin. Africa shouldn't just uh, uh, be a receiver of our university's expansion. We need to drive forward cooperation projects among academic institutions in which students, of course, but also professors and researchers can jump continents back and forth. And Spain has a, a to uh, take the lead within Europe in our arrival to African institutions. Thank you very much. And we remain open to any uh, cooperation among institutions to keep the spirit of this seminar alive as together we always get further. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. And now we're going to give the floor to the director of Casa Africa, Jose Segura. Dear friends, Casa Africa, those that are members of Casa Africa are very happy to have cooperated in the creation of this encounter together with the CPE and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, DG Africa. We've heard very interesting presentations. The General Secretary of Universities, the last presentation, well, the last panel in this last session, and everything, all the speakers have given us a great lesson. Uh, the Secretary of State, in her presentation, concluded by saying, this should have continuity, and I fully agree with this. And I felt a curiosity to know what was the role of Casa Africa in previous uh, encounters. And there were encounters in the past. The first one held in Madrid, all coordinated by the CRUE, but with the participation of Casa Africa. There was another meet encounter or seminar in Maputo, another one in Las Palmas University, a fourth at La Laguna University, a fifth that was planned, but then there was the pandemic that made it impossible. So Casa Africa as an institution, as a consortium, co-participated by three entities had always pursued certain objectives. And we are attaining them little by little. And they have been realized in a specific project. We have promoted the participation of students. We have been able to consolidate, as Fernandez de la Vega, had the chance to participate 15 days ago in a meeting in Casa Africa. So there is now a project. The project is name is to teach about Africa that has been on for more than 11 years, where more than 6,000 students from the Canary Islands participate and with 300 teachers. So there's been creating like a whole context and environment. And also teachers from the medicine faculty at the Las Palmas University have helped set in a hospital in Mozambique. We now have a first generation of 500 physicians in Mozambique. So I would say to the Secretary of State, I agree with you. This is a long journey. We will continue journeying. And at a time of a spectacular transformation of humanity and education, we are at a time 
at a time of where we have witnessed how the speed of knowledge generation, the speed, I'm repeating, is faster and faster, but is not so fast the speed of how this knowledge is conveyed into technology. So we make progress at good speed in knowledge generation. We are very speedy in that, but this does not have a direct impact on society, on the economic life. So university system is also evolving. Digitalization of knowledge is also spectacular. And now we have new avenues to connect universities and researchers in Africa, this continent that we're all in love with. So this encounter will continue, I'm sure, and with the passion of all of us, and Casa Africa will continue participating in it. Uh, and in representation of the institution Casa Africa, I want to congratulate you all, also those that are, have been following us in different uh, teaching centers in Africa and Spain. I would like to congratulate the vice rectors of different universities. And I would like to congratulate to all of you that made this encounter possible. Thank you so much and have a great day.